Friends, colleagues, African compatriots, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking Ibrahim Asal and Trust Africa for inviting me to share my thoughts on Africa Day. It is a real pleasure to do so. I will speak about the sector, higher education, where I've worked in and to which I've dedicated most of my professional life. This is a sector, I believe, whose transformation, nay, should I say revolution, is necessary if Africa and the world are to have a sustainable future. But it also requires all of us to look beyond a national lens and even a continental lens if this revolution is to happen. I, of course, come to these reflections from my location in London, where I've recently assumed the position of director of SOAS, University of London. This can be both a strength and a weakness. It is a strength because it allows us to develop an intellectual and institutional bridge between the North and South between the developed and developing world. But it also can be a weakness, for I am physically dislocated from the continent, and however recent my departure may have been, I am still not immersed in the daily contextual realities of the African context. My thoughts are therefore offered tentatively with a view to inspiring debate on how to transform universities and teaching and learning and research in this globalized historical moment. See colleagues, compatriots, we live in interesting but dangerous times. Our world today is as unequal as it was before World, War, world Wars I and II. We are increasingly becoming a socially and politically polarized as we were then. Right-wing populist and nativist parties stalk all of our lands, deepening divides among our communities, both nationally and internationally. Political and economic elites are paralyzed about what to do, or have been unable to marshal the political will to undertake what needs to be done. And yet what needs to be done is known. At the high heart of the crisis today is the lack of social justice. We have taken millions out of poverty, but millions remain mired in misery. As important, if not more threatening to our collective future, is inequality. So many have too little because so few have too much. This is the popular realization of our time and it is why globalization has come under attack. Populist and nativist parties have been able to mobilize on the foundation of this resentment. But they, of course, have no answers as they propel us into a retreat into nativism and chauvinism of all kinds. The net effect has been a deepening of divides within and between nations, which imperils the human community. Climate change, public health, energy, inequality, and social and political polarization are transnational challenges that require us to cohere and act as one. Only if we build the bridges of human solidarity will we survive as a human species. This is the central lesson emanating from the COVID-19 pandemic, which brings the principle of social justice to the very heart of the global conversation. By doing so, it creates the possibility, only a possibility, of enabling conditions for building one of the platforms of human solidarity that is so necessary in our world. But this is not inevitable. Indeed, the pandemic has demonstrated both our collective strength and our central weakness. Our collective strength lies in our ingenuity, reflected in the scientific and technological revolution underway, which had enabled the development of multiple vaccines in an unprecedented short time frame. Yet COVID-19 
also revealed our central human weakness, manifested in the crude we are first response that, enas- that has enabled the nationalism in the procurement and deployment of vaccines. This has occurred despite the repeated advice of the World Health Organization and individual public health specialists that the key to bringing this pandemic under control was an equitable deployment of vaccines around the world. If some countries remained in the pandemic, many of our professionals said, none in our world are safe. We either defeated this virus collectively or we succumb to its devastating social and economic consequences. How to do this is one of the defining questions of our era. It is as relevant to higher education as to other parts of the human existence. There is an important scientific rationale for acting collectively reflected in the work of Tanya Douglas, the chair in biomedical engineering and innovation at the University of Cape Town, who died in March 2021. In her TED talk, To Design Better Tech, Understand Context, she lamented the deployment of inappropriate technologies from the industrialized to the developing world. Prof Douglas's work pointed to the need to think of innovation that is contextually relevant. Understanding context requires an understanding of the social, political, and economic futures of our society. It highlights the need for interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work and the importance of considering marginalized groups whose interests and concerns are often forgotten. Only then can we sustainably address our transnational challenges and advance social justice in our world. Formulating and or adapting technologies to the contextual circumstances of the developing world is a responsibility of all of us, but needs to be led by the institutions of the South. This is only one part of the challenge, which also requires establishing institutional infrastructure and developing the enabling human resource capabilities. We need more inventors, scientists, technologists, social actors, academics and students, in short, innovators. For this to happen, we need enabling environments. We need adequately resourced and academically excellent universities and vocational colleges that train research and innovate, companies that are entrepreneurial, incubators that can nurture new technologies, and venture capital networks that can sponsor these initiatives. At one level, we recognize this. Our policies in the developed and developing world speak of the importance of inclusive, equitable, and quality education. Yet we behave institutionally in a manner that deepens inequalities and institutional divides. Global partnerships, scholarships, and mobility across the world are features of the globalization era. Yet, the brain drain not only persists, but has escalated dramatically, weakening institutions in many parts of the developing world. This dynamic is not the only causal factor in the weakening of African institutions and universities. They were irreparably damaged by the structural adjustment policies in the 1980s, when international development agencies called for the prioritization of primary and secondary education, resulting in the underfunding of universities. The idea was that tertiary education would be located in the developed world. This posture policy was partially reversed in subsequent decades, but the damage had been done. Our global partnership has not fundamentally changed since the 1980s, and dress on direct scholarship to talented individuals in the developing world to acquire tertiary education in Europe and North America. 
The assumption is that these students will return home. But the evidence of the last few decades is that this is not the case. When students move, life happens. They fall in love. They have families. They get jobs. And they stay in the global north. At a conference on the African diaspora, which I attended at the African Union in Addis Ababa in 2019, Abdullahi Roye demonstrated that more than 80% of students do not return. This experience is typical of much of the developing world, including China and India. China has reversed the trend only recently, and Singapore has been the exception to this trend in the South. In any case, the corollary in the developing world is that institutions have been weakened. Human resource capacities are not developed and inclusive development is compromised. Some among us speak of brain circulation rather than brain dead and the importance of remittances to the developing world. But if we are honest, we would recognize that these are weak counter trends that do not fundamentally change the negative institutional and structural dynamics that accompany the brain drain. I must stress that this is not only a problem for the developing world. It is as much a problem for the developed world. As human resource capacities decline in the developing world, so do our ability to deal with the structural challenges of our era. All of our challenges are transnational in character. Climate change, inequality, public health, and the social and political polarization have global consequences. We need the institutional infrastructure and human resources in both the developed and developing world to stem such challenges at their source, wherever they emerge. Yet our global partnership methodologies undermine this in practice, if not in intent. I am not advocating from, for some autarkic retreat into nationalism, nationhood or ethnicity. I do not believe this is possible. And I am of the view that the human spirit has simultaneously an impulse to wander and explore, to globalize, if you may, and to identify and familiarize, to localize, if you may. These are not mutually exclusive agendas, as populist and nativist parties tend to suggest. We can love our families and community networks and still practice a human solidarity. It is possible to be both local and global. Indeed, this is essential to survive as a human species. I am advocating a new methodology of global partnership, one that is more rooted in institutions than individuals. In higher education, this would require joint teaching programs, co-curriculum, co-curriculation, and split-site scholarships that would enable students to gain scientific knowledge, develop a global consciousness, have access to new equipment and funding networks, and yet be sufficiently rooted in institutions of the developing world to allow for this knowledge and skills to, de to be deployed within local contexts. It may require co-financing and co-ownership of research centers and institutes between multiple universities in the North and South. Such a methodology would allow students from the developed world to have the opportunity to visit and understand context of the developing world and to develop skills and knowledge that are more universally applicable. This goes against the grain of some of, some of the strategic plans of some universities in the developed world. Some of the more high-ranking institutions believe their brands will be, be, will, be diluted, sorry, will be diluted by their joint teaching agendas and their mission is to train scientists and knowledge brokers of our world, whatever their scientific strengths. However recognized their academic cohort may be, however talented their students are, their contributions are limited. In their legitimate desire to be competitive, 
they undermine their own mission. They have forgotten that great science needs to be accompanied by contextual understanding to have impact. The economic elites need an understanding of the context of the developing world. This is only possible through global teams of researchers and institutions coming together, deploying collective knowledge, skill sets and understanding to develop contextually relevant technologies and solutions to the challenges of our time. We need an equitable global partnership of institutions that are rooted in the diversity of the human community and deployed across all of our countries. This is a global agenda that is more equitable, socially just, sustainable, and yet universally relevant for this era. It is an agenda that is not possible under the business models that underpin higher education in the Anglo-Saxon world, immersed with the politics and character of particular nation states. Some of the strongest higher education systems are premised on a business model in which foreign students, mainly from the developing world, cross-subsidize the costs of the training of domestic students. This model is not only unsustainable, but further engenders and consolidates the institutional and societal inequalities that erode collective global capacities to address universal challenges. Higher education and the business models that underpin it must be fundamentally reimagined if they are to rise to our current challenges. This requires a political magnanimity and social solidarity of notion states, political classes and economic elites that has not always been forthcoming. Yet even in this moment, there are seedling, seedlings of hope. Partnerships between Af the African Research Universities Alliance, a network of research universities on the continent, and the UKRI and the Guild of European Research Universities have been built. And an engagement and advocacy effort was undertaken with the European Union and the African uh, Union. This initiative culminated in February 14, 2022, when the African and European Unions announced an AU-EU innovation agenda, which has at it, uh, as its core mandate the strengthening of African research capacity. The announcement was quickly followed by Arua and the Guild of European Universities releasing a joint statement expressing support for the agenda and in particular for the development and strengthening uh, the clusters of excellence. The strengthening of world-class research and innovation infrastructures and the pro promotion of joint African-European masters and doctoral degree programs. It is rare for there to be such a quick transcontinental university affirmation and support for a development partnership between two regional political unions. Yet, it is perfectly understandable given the fact that the initiative is a game changer and likely to transform the de developmental space in significant ways. First, it is a long-term investment in addressing the structural inequalities in the global academy. Second, it fundamentally rewrites the rules of global university partnerships, directing these to institutional collaboration and cooperation while simultaneously addressing the resource inequities that bedevil such partnerships. Third, it explicitly advocates for the development of joint cross-continental teaching and learning on the grounds that this would assist in stemming the brain drain and enable scientific and technological capacities to remain on the African continent. Finally, it enables an interaction between global and local knowledge systems, thereby allowing for the adaptation of global solutions to local contexts. This is what it means to suggest that science should have no boundaries. It should be a continuous process of engagement between theory and application, between the universal and the local. This is the point which is pow powerfully made by Tanya Douglas, who insisted in a TED talk 
on the importance of context in the design of biomedical technologies for the developing world. These measures are also fundamentally important for they speak to the greatest historical challenge of our time, how to develop institutional capacities and build human capabilities across the world to address our transnational challenges. And make no mistake, this is not charity. It is, connect, it is critical to our collective survival. I say again, all of our challenges, pandemics, climate change, inequality, social and political polarization, extend beyond national borders and require global solutions. Without this, none of us are safe. As a human community, we must learn to swim together or we will collectively sink as planetary destruction or some other crisis results in the extinction of the human species. The AU EU Innovation Partnership on Research and Teaching starts, off, uh, starts us off on a path to avoid this outcome. In the process, it will challenge all of the existing models of international education. It will challenge the Anglo-Saxon model, which emphasizes the recruitment and training of students from across the world at universities in the UK, US and Australia. This model is focused on the individual, accelerates the brain drain, and inevitably weakens institutional capacities in the South. The irony is that this is done by public universities in the North, whose documents are often peppered with commitments to global solidarity and social inclusion of the poor and marginalized. The academics are often leading liberal and progressive intellectuals of their societies, yet they pursue business models which are designed by governments to earn foreign currency and increase local GDP, but which drive global inequalities and socially polarize our world. The AU-EU innovation agenda also challenges the benevolent, market-driven model of private and public universities in the North who offer online university education at lower cost to poor and middle class students in the developing world. This was first enabled by digital technologies and subsequently accelerated by the pandemic, which pushed all universities into emergency remote learning. Private companies and public universities who offer this type of online education are glossing over three fundamental realities. First, they assume that learning only happens in the classroom, in this case, the virtual one. But anyone familiar with universities would know that students learn as much outside the classroom as they do inside it. They learn from the social interaction that universities enable across identity divides and from the plurality of perspectives and values. Second, these institutions ignore that however strong the academics may be, their curriculum remains the poorer for its lack of local knowledge. Context matters and a model of higher education in which institutions in the North develop curriculums which they deliver to learners in the South is not only patronizing, but also pedagogically questionable. Finally, this benevolent market-driven online learning agenda again passes, bypasses all local universities, in the process weakening their capacities and further compromising our collective ability to address the local manifestations of transnational challenges. The AU EU innovation agenda advances international educational development on a revolutionary assumption that it is possible to develop equitable partnerships in an unequal world. This will require solidarity and humility from institutions in the North. But it should also be premised on the principle of financial sustainability. These partnerships can all, cannot always be underwritten by the EU. They require income streams to be developed and an investment from African governments 
who need to recognize that one can only truly be free when one develops the political will to begin financing one's own initiatives. These partnerships also require a continental platform, not only because this is the only way Africa's limited number of universities can have the scale of training required for developmental impact, but also be because it would mitigate against the curriculum retreating into a national parochialism that sometimes animates the political discourse in many of our societies. The AU, EU innovation agenda is truly groundbreaking. Political elites in the UK, US and Australia, and even those in China and Russia, would do well to take heed of the development philosophy that underlies this plan. They should also recognize that slogans like going global cannot remain rhetorical instruments trotted out at international summits. They require a practical implementation. The Europeans have led on this in their recent summit with the AU. Let's hope that other political elites will have the maturity and courage to do the same. This is the question that confronts us where I am in the UK and in the broader, ang broader Anglo-Saxon world. And I must say that the recent de public debates in the UK do not inspire me with confidence. Take for instance, HEPI's recent report on international students in the UK, developed by London Economics, which was received with much fanfare in the UK and in the broader public. The report suggested that 496,000 international students benefit the UK to the tune of 28.8 billion pounds. Moreover, the benefits are broadly spread, adding millions to local economies across the UK, including 290 million pounds a year to Sheffield Central, 181 million pounds to Cardiff Central, and 171 million pounds to Glasgow Central. There's much of value in that report. It is, important, it is an important corrective to some of the hostility in the United Kingdom around international students and their national value, providing evidence that they are not only a cost, but also a benefit to the United Kingdom. But should we have in the United Kingdom not be concerned about the narrow commercial and nationalistic approach to the framing of the report and much of the government's plans around international education. This report masks the fact that, we are going, that the way we are going about international education has some serious challenges. Again, accelerating the brain drain and weakening institutional capacity and human capabilities in the developing world. The long-term consequences of this are dangerous for the world because we are moving in a historical moment where, as I've said earlier, our biggest challenges are increasingly transnational and will require global solutions. If we are going to address these, we are going to need to build institutional capacity and human capabilities around the world, which will require rethinking our global partnerships in higher education. Yet, None of this discourse emerged in the public debate. The UUK conference in 2021 in Newcastle correctly celebrated the strength of UK universities and their response to the COVID pan pandemic. But it also revealed that there was an urgent need in the higher education sector for a deeper deliberation on the internationalization of higher education and how UK universities could collectively respond to the global challenges of our time. This required a greater appreciation of the tension between the UK's short-term need to build financially sustainable institution and its long-term desire to be part of a global academy that is capable of responding to the global challenges of our time. Essentially, we in the UK required the deeper and more nuanced conversation than we were currently having. Otherwise, 
we will act now in a manner that destroys our collective global future. I am sorry to conclude on an ominous note. For centuries we have pretended that science has no boundaries. Yet every day we all over the world establish institutional national boundaries that constrain science, knowledge and innovation. We need to break down these boundaries in Europe, in the United States, in China, in Russia, in Africa, all over the world. We need to borrow and learn from each other in a collaborative and equal manner. Lesson, le lessons learned and innovations developed in particular contexts could lead to changes in the rest of the world. A global academy of the commons needs to be built so that we collectively understand how innovation can play a part in creating a more inclusive world. This is more necessary than ever before. As indicated, all of our challenges are transnational in character. Addressing the transnational challenges of our time, of which COVID-19 is only the most current manifestation, will provide a social and political foundation for us to survive as a global community. It is a bridge of hope between an unequal and fractured past and present and an inclusive collective future for which we need enabling deliberative arenas. We need to have the courage to ask the hard questions about our practices and improve them where we can. We have the intellectual resources across disciplines and institutions that can assist us in thinking through innovation more carefully to ensure that it is contextually grounded and inclusive. By doing so, we will generally address the inequalities and challenges of our time and through this create a socially inclusive and humane world. But this reopens an acknowledgement, but this requires an acknowledgement of the systemic problems we confront and an honest conversation to resolve them. Are we, academics all over the world, and especially in Africa, ready to address this? Thank you.